I'll be ready when Jesus comes back. Amen. I certainly will be. I had uh, an overlapping thought about we've been studying devils for a while, and I wanted to. Um, I, I think I wanted to embed this teaching somewhere, and I, I kind of it, it slipped my mind. And uh, the older I get, I get more slippage up here. Amen? We get more slippage. It gets greasy or something up in here. And uh, things slip my mind. But I wanted to do this and, and show you an example from your Bible of what I refer to as uh, high wickedness. Spiritual wickedness in high places. I made the um, the the illustration or the analogy of in any kind of organization um, that organization or that body whether it's a work environment or it's a political state or what a family unit or whatever they can go one of two ways the leaders of that body can follow the Lord and trust and obey God's word. And even if those underneath them don't, God is still going to bless that body because the head is trying to live for the Lord. And I, I, you can see that over and over. But when the heads of any kind of organization, whether it, like I say, whether it be a family or it could be a church body, it could be a, 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 some sort of business or a company, a banking financial institution, a religious organization, or a political state, if those leaders are anti-Christ, then it's because there are spirits that rule over the heads of that organization. And I can tell you from the scriptures that they are following evil spirits and they are doing evil things very evil things so let me give you an example we'll read the scriptures let me give you this example or, or i ask you a question do you believe that there could be let's say some sort of secret private club where the elite of of a let's say let's say New York City there's a lot of big business based in New York City right the executives and the high ranking people in these companies they make a ton of money they have a lot of power because of that money they have political power they have financial power they have a lot of power do you think that there could be a some sort of exclusive club where only the wealthiest men go to and they can participate in drunken parties, illicit things going on, uh, and basically people there to cater to every pleasure they desire. Do you believe that that's possible, that there could be things like that in this world? I do. I absolutely do. Uh, be because of th what I know from the scriptures. And I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
Now think about it. If these people have all this power where they can get away with whatever they want because they are in an elite group and they all watch out for each other and they all cover up for one another and they all bribe judges or police officers or officials or whatever. And, and some of these people can be heads of religions. Oh, I believe that one. Um, these people have power and if you, let's say in some way, stand up against that, they could do things to you. Do you believe that? So I'm not con that crazy conspiracy guy. I just believe that things like that go on. Uh, whether it's in a small town situation or a big environment like New York City or Washington, D.C., Oh, I absolutely, I, Jeff's back there, got a big, he's got a Cheshire cat grin from ear to ear. Okay. Obviously, he has seen something or knows of something. I'm not even going to ask, but. So, if that were to take place, these people have a lot of power. Who are we? Well, we have God. We have God. We can call upon the Lord and God can come down for us or send angels to watch over us and protect us and they can't touch us. I believe that. I believe it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And here it is against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, uh, you're in Ephesians. Look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So let's say that, let's say that Ron here was the chief executive officer of IBM in New York, New York. And he makes $150 million a year. Can he afford to go to this club where the, the dues, you have to pay dues like every month and it costs $5,000 a month. You can afford that, right? You make $150 million a year. So because of the position that Ron is in and because he can make decisions that affect hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world, he is in a high place and there is a spirit. Uh, let's say you're not saved. There is a spirit then that works through you that can cause you to do things for the devil that you're not, you're not even aware you're doing it for the devil. You're, you're doing it to get rich. You're doing it to get more power. But these devils... They control you. They manipulate you. They inspire. Have you ever had a thought that you knew came from God? You ever had a thought that you knew came from God, right? Okay. It's the same way. Devils can inspire people. Okay. So if you wonder why people like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer can stand there straight face and look at a camera and say, we want border security when you know for a fact they don't. What they, what they really want is a flood of illegal people to come into this country and then give them all right to vote. Give them government money and government uh, handouts and then give them a right to vote without being a citizen. Who are they going to vote for, Ron? They're going to vote for Nancy and Chuck. They're all going to move to San Francisco, which that's fine with me. So, but that's the evil spirit that controls these people. They're lost. And as such, they are enemies of the gospel. Father in heaven, guide us through your word. Father, we don't want to live in fear. But there are some very scary things going on in this world. Teach us, dear God, to stand against them, no matter the cost. Help us, dear God, to put on the whole armor. And help us to be aware of just how evil things really are. Show us things out of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Now, I'm going to run through some verses very quickly. I don't expect you to follow this. I just picked out some verses 
in the Bible that kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Uh, 2 Kings 13, we have um, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He parted not therefrom. When the king is evil, look at your Bible. When the king is evil, he causes the people of Israel to sin. When our leaders are evil, and listen, I'm going to say something. I like some of the things Donald Trump has done in this country. But his wickedness and immorality scars the office of the President of the United States. It scars that office. And he can do things that we like, that we, that sound like something a right wing Christian person would do, but he is not a Christian man. Not. He has committed terrible sins and used his money and power to try to cover those sins up. Okay? And that's what's coming out about it. And I have no doubt about it whatsoever. So he, you pray, I tell, I've told you to pray for uh, Barack Obama, I tell you to pray for Donald Trump to get saved. Okay? But when it starts at the top, the evil trickles down. Uh, in same chapter, verse 10, uh, we have Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, reigned over Israel and Samaria, he reigned 16 years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Then we have Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. He reigned forty and one years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And then we have Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned in Israel in Samaria six months. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was so evil, God only allowed him to reign six months. Six months, and God had him killed. He made Israel to sin. 2 Kings 15, we have Menahem, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel. And he reigned ten years in Samaria, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. That, those wicked, and you can take this, and I, I did not include all of the places in the Bible where it talks about a king and how evil he was. I just picked out a few to show my point. These kings represent spiritual wickedness in high places. And it was because of them that God took the ten northern tribes and booted them out of their land by having the Assyrians came and take them and made them to be slaves. And then the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, Nebuchadnezzar came and got them for 70 years, took them out of their houses, took them out of their land, away from their cattle, away from everything, made them slaves in Babylon for 70 years. Because of the spiritual wickedness that was in the high places. And the voting American does not understand this. They do not understand that when you elect corrupt people to office. I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican. When you elect corrupt people to office, they corrupt the office. Ezekiel chapter 8. Now I want you to turn there. Ezekiel chapter 8. God showed Ezekiel and he's going to show us spiritual wickedness in high places and how it works. Ezekiel is going to be able to get behind the scenes information. Who in here has ever wanted to plant like a camera in some evil, wicked, liberal politician's office just to hear what goes on every day. I tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to put a camera and a microphone in the offices of Benny Hinn, Joyce Myers, Creflo Dollar, all these other quacks that are online. To hear the actual lifestyle of these people. Because I believe the Bible. I believe they are full of sin. 
full of wickedness. I believe that. Because of the high position and power and money that they hold. They control everything. They control, there's people in high places that control Christian broadcasting. Christian publications. You understand what I'm saying? Do you know why we don't have adult Sunday school quarterly books in here? Because I don't trust them. If I don't know who wrote them, I don't trust them. So what we have in here is a Bible. When we come to Sunday school, let's, let's study the Bible. Okay? Because I know that evil spirits control bad people who are controlling the publication companies. The music companies. The places where pastors can download their custom-built sermons. Do you know they can do that? They can download and pay good money for them, but they'll download custom-designed sermons, pre-written out, even got all the illustrations, everything, so that pastor can basically follow that script and if he's, if he's any good at public speaking, he doesn't have to stand there and read that script. He can pull from it and give it out to those people. But he's not, he's not been in the Word to get that. He didn't spend time with God and labor in the Word and pull that out of Scripture. He didn't do that. So that, I believe that those kind of things are going on. And God has given Ezekiel now. He's, he's taking Ezekiel into the spirit realm and Ezekiel is going to be invisible. Ezekiel is going to see things that are going on in the temple that nobody else knows is going on. If you've never read Ezekiel 8, you're in for a, a shocker. The National Enquirer would love to get hold of this story. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 3. He put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. That would hurt. I've had my mom grab me by the hair. That is not good. Huh? Used to. Used to could. Caleb keeps his hair short for a reason, I bet. So the spirit, and the Spirit lifted me between the earth and the heaven. And watch this. He brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So Ezekiel is going to get to see things like he's there, but they don't know he's there. Okay? It's like Ezekiel has a security camera and a microphone in these rooms with these people watching what's going on behind the scenes. So he went to the door of the inner gate. He brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy? There was an idol. An image. A sitting image. In the door, the entry door, the inner gate that looked toward the north, there was an idol there and it provoked God to jealousy. Because God said, I'm a jealous God. If you think that I'm going to let you worship me and call me Allah, you're wrong. You don't call me Allah. You call me by my name. You call, and, and I had a son. Allah didn't. So don't call me that. I'm a jealous God. And if I see an idol somewhere, we, on the way back, we passed. What I found out quickly was there was a Baptist church just north of Poplar Bluff, Missouri, with a big statue of Jesus by the front door. I saw that statue and I thought, what is that, a Catholic church? And as I drove by, the sign read, such and such Baptist church. And I went, that's crazy. But they got it, they've got an idol, a statue of Jesus Christ. From what I could see, and I was only doing little miles an hour up that way. But that, I'd, I'd have to go back and take a picture of it before I could tell you that's the absolute truth. But that blew me away, how there could be a, a statue standing there at a Baptist church. They ought to know better. Do not make unto thee any graven image, God said. So now verse 4. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw on the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, north, and behold northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. 
Now, I want you to get this picture. God's going to take Ezekiel on a journey starting from the outside of the temple all the way to the inside of the sanctuary. And at four places, he's going to stop Ezekiel and he say, Do you see this? Right here at the entry, there's an idol standing there, probably to Baal. But there's an image of jealousy right there as they come in. And God said, I'm jealous. Because I'm supposed to be their God. Not that. This is my house. Not that idol's house. The illustration would be somebody coming into your house and putting a sign of Baphomet by your front door, Sandy. And you'd go, what are you doing? This is my house. Get that abominable thing out of here. This is my house. Okay. You'd have a right to be angry, would you not? What would you, what would you do to it? What would you do if somebody had a big painting of Baphomet, the evil Satan goat, there at your front door? Whoa. <laughs> cut the feed, cut the feed. No, don't, don't cut the feed. Tear it up. Bust it up right in front of them. Bust it over their heads. That's your house. Wouldn't you be jealous? What, Ron, wouldn't you be jealous if another man was trying to make entry into your house while your wife was in there? That's your house and that's your wife. And God saw Israel as his bride and that was his house. And he said, how dare you? And see, the thing is, Israel, the bride, the wife, invited that idol in. Put it there on purpose. Are you catching this so far? See, that's a, that's, we're not even, we just got into the entry of the gate. We just walked in the front door already. So verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Ezekiel, do you see this? Ezekiel's going, God, that is, that is awful that they did that. God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's actually worse as we go in. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture people who run large companies or people who run large publishing houses or people who run... Um, who are heads of religion. Because these this was the house of God. And this was the tribe of Levi. And it was their responsibility. And they're the ones that did it. It was the priests. The preachers. The pastors that did it. The pastors put it there. You know what an, you know what an idol is in comparison? Here's the idol. Here is Jesus. He's the word of God. This idol's in NIV. It's an NIV Bible or a New American Standard Bible. It is, a, it is an image of jealousy. It is, try, it is their God, but it's not the same as the real God. Does that make sense to everybody? That's, and God said, it's worse than that. So then, in verse 7, He brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. Now Ezekiel's going to be a peeping Tom. You can just see him going. What are they doing in there? Okay. So when I digged in the wall, behold a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. That, now watch this now. This is God's house. This is the house that Solomon built. And they had taken it. And they had portrayed on the wall all of these. You know what abominable beasts are? Devils. 
they put up on the wall the images of devils, their gods that they worshipped. And all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. No wonder God destroyed this house. Let's say, T Todd, let's say you and Courtney uh, ended up buying a house. It was a good price and you bought it, but you didn't really take a good look at it. And after you bought it, you went in and you found out the place was loaded with termites. It was full of roaches. There was, there was bats up in the attic. There was all kinds of critters that were coming in and out all the time. And there was no way in the world, because the wood was so rotted and everything else, there's no way in the world that you could salvage this. So what's the best thing to do? Tear it down. And that's, if somebody, gangs had come in and written all kinds of filthy words all over the walls and put nasty pictures up on the wall. Yeah, tear the thing down, build, build it brand new. And that's what God did. God said, this is my house, you ruined my house. So, verse 11, And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients. Now, this is important. Because in any organization, you always have a large... Everybody look up here. You have a large amount of people here on the bottom. You have a middle management group that's less people. You have an upper management group that is a tiny group. And then you have the heads. Right? It's like, like a pyramid. And what you're going to see, the first thing is the entry, and that's what everybody gets to see. And God said it's worse than that. So he takes him up one level to the middle management group, the 70 of the house of Israel. And he says the 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Look at this, in the dark. They don't want their deeds seen. And they don't want the light. So, churches, you can tell when a transformation has taken place in that church, when they take down all these beautiful old church lights out of the sanctuary and make it dark while everything's up on the stage. You think, you think I'm just making that up? They don't like light. And we've got two light bulbs we've got to replace in these back lamps. They're going to get replaced this week because I'm sick and tired of this dark room. I don't like it dark in here. I don't want it dark in here. I want light. Amen. You look at this. They're in the dark. Uh... Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath not forsaken the earth. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. The Lord seeth us not. You know what that means? We can do whatever we want to do. And do they? Do the priests molest boys? They do it in the chambers of darkness. God seeth us not, is what they say. Now that's the second thing that he saw, and it's worse. He's going to say, it's worse, Ezekiel. So look at verse 13. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. I'll explain him in a minute. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. He's seeing women here in the house of God at the, at the gate, at the north side. Do you know what was on the north of the tabernacle? Huh? Table of showbread. That table of showbread is Jesus. It represents Christ. But instead of Christ being there, let me tell you who Tammuz is. Was, was it you and I that was talking about J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis a while ago? In ancient mythology, most cultures have a story of a god 
that offered his life in sacrifice for people, for the benefit of people, and is awaiting to be reborn and resurrected. Tammuz is a name for the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Because he is a dying God. He has a wound in his forehead, a deadly wound. But in Revelation 13, we see that that deadly wound gets healed. He then is resurrected from the dead. So these women weeping for Tammuz, you know what that developed into? Lent. The season of Lent in the Catholic Church is all about the weeping in the morning for Tammuz, who they say is that image on a crucifix. And I'm telling you, that's not Jesus. It is not Jesus. If you don't say amen, I'm going to go outside and have, stop people in their cars and say, say amen. That is not Jesus. Jesus, that's Tammuz. They're weeping over the death of the Antichrist and they want him back alive again. And listen to this, they've brought this into the house of God. Now remember what I said about your Bible. If one Bible says the Son of God and another Bible says a Son of the Gods, one of them is Christ and one of them is Antichrist. If one of them says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and this one doesn't say anything at all like that, that's not the same God. It's not the same Word. It's not the same as the one that we follow. You understand that? They're weeping for the Antichrist to be brought back to life again. I believe the world in totality is going to want to follow the beast all the way to the death. They'll do it willingly. But then he said in verse 15, Son of man, turn to yet again. Thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Now we're at the fourth area. In verse 16. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men. Now see now we're up to the upper management. The guys Todd who are near the top who have a lot of power a lot of authority and they get their directions from the top and they make sure that those things happen. And I believe that in many of these organizations they are controlled by I say, I sound like crazy, wild YouTube conspiracy theorists. They're controlled by Satan. But they are. They are controlled by Satan. Banking institutions. You know, when the mark of the beast comes out, you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have that. Do you not see that banks are heavily involved right now in preparing this world to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead? I mean, come on, are we not living in that time? I believe we are. And so does a lot of other people too. So we have five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. That is a sham that they did that. They turned their backs to God. With their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they worship the sun toward the east. In God's house, Megan, in God's house, they did this. So the equivalent would be people in this church falling down and worshiping some sort of image in this church. I wouldn't stand for that one second. It's an abomination. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? Four things he showed him. And every time he showed him something, he said, let's get farther into the temple. And the farther we get inside, the worse it gets. And the higher up we get, 
in the government of the people of Israel, the worse the abomination. And that's what he showed him. He said, for they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? I don't either. Lord, show me what it means when they put their branch to the no, to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Where does judgment begin, people? House of God. And when you, if you go to the next chapter, Ezekiel chapter 9, we're not going to do that tonight, but if you go to Ezekiel chapter 9, God set up, well, I guess I am going there. God set up men with swords in their hand. And he said, I'm going to send you out and you're going to start killing people. God got in a killing mood. He said, I've had it. No more. See, when God told Saul, you know, your rebellion is as witchcraft. And God told David that he took his mercy away from Saul. And that's exactly what he did. When Saul repented, Samuel did not forgive him. And in this case here, as they see the sword coming and they see their fellows being slaughtered, they may cry and ask for mercy. And God said, don't you dare give it to them. I gave them opportunity and the time is done. I'm going to kill them. Anybody listening to me, if you're not right with God, the time to repent is now, not later. You may not get later. But he said he had a man that had a writer's ink horn. It's a horn filled with ink. And he told that man with the writer's ink horn, he said, take that ink and go. And as you see people who are crying and praying and weeping because of the abominations that are going on. In other words, when you see my people, I want you to mark them. That's the, it's a representation of the seal of God that God's going to seal Israel with in Revelation chapter 7. Do not mix that up with the mark of the beast. But he said, I want you to mark them on their forehead. That's the seal of the living God. I'm going to spare them, but I'm going to kill everybody else. And God said, you guys with the swords, I want you to go through and start killing everybody, but you're going to start in my house and work your way out. That 25 men that we saw, killed every one of them. Those women weeping for Tammuz, drove swords into their hearts, cut their heads off, killed every one of them. The 70 elders of Israel, killed every one of them. That, my friends, is the wrath of an angry God. And he was justified in doing it, was he not? So ask the question, why did God spare me? What abominations have you committed? What sins have you done? And yet God spared you. You ought to thank him. Uh, a couple years ago, I did this. And I'm not going to spend any time on it. Second Chronicles 33, we have Manasseh. And I noticed on the, on the great seal of the United States of America, there's 13 rows of stones. And the 14th row is that all-seeing eye. That all-seeing eye is not God's eye. God doesn't have one eye. God, we're made in his image. God has two of them. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, plural, not his eye. That eye belongs to, what is it, Zechariah, who talked about the idle shepherd. And that idle shepherd, I-D-O-L, shepherd, is the opposite of the Antichrist, or the opposite of Christ. Boy, I messed that up, didn't I? The idle shepherd is the Antichrist. We'll have to roll that film back and splice that out. That idle shepherd is the Antichrist. And God put his right eye out. Took it out. Did you know that Odin, 
the God of the Scandinavian peoples had his right eye put out. Odin is the idol shepherd. He's the Antichrist. They followed the Antichrist. They didn't know it. That's who they follow. There's 13 rows of stones here. And that 14th one represents the Antichrist. He's, he, that, what that eye sitting there is spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what that represents. And I had noted that in that chapter, chapter uh, 2 Chronicles 33, Manasseh did exactly 13 things. And all of them were religious things. He built high places, altars for Balaam, groves, worshipped host of heaven, served them, built altars, uh, built altars for the host of heaven. That's the stars, that's the gods, little g. He caused his children to pass through the fire. He, he, the man killed his own kids. He slaughtered and sacrificed his own children. That man's a Satanist. Manasseh was a Satan worshiper. He observed times, he, that means astrology, used enchantments, used witchcraft, dealt with familiar spirit, and with wizards. That's the 13 things that he did. The 14th thing was different. The 14th thing Manasseh did was something no other king had done. He said of carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God. He went into the most holy place, I believe, Spencer, and he put an idol right there. Maybe he took the Ark of the Covenant out. I don't know, but he put it right there. That's our new God now. The Antichrist is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And in Ezekiel 14, you want to study this out this week? It'd be a good study for you. Ezekiel 14, God told the men of Israel, they came to him and said, Ezekiel, will you inquire to God for us? And God told Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel, let me tell you about these men. They are spiritual wickedness in high places. They have, they have idols in their heart. Now I want you guys to look at me for a minute. Okay? And we'll look at you eye to eye, because I love you. What are your idols? What are the idols in your heart? Don't tell me. And don't act like you don't have one. Or I'll say it like this. I think you're good people, but... With every body, there is a stumbling block of iniquity. And that's what Ezekiel 14 said. Something that the devil will use to cause you to fall. And it's easy to do. It's easy. He does not have to work hard to get you to do it. It's easy. Get rid of it. Get rid of it, because I want to tell you something. In Ezekiel 14, I may teach on this next Sunday night. In Ezekiel 14, God told Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel, you listen to me. Those men have idols in their heart. They have a stumbling block of, an, of their iniquity. They put it in there. And he said, I'm going to answer them according to their stumbling block. In other words, if, if they want to keep their sin, fine. But what they hear, they're going to think it's from me, but it's not. Because I have evil spirits that lie really well. And they're going to, they're going to end up believing things that is not true. And it's because the stumbling block of iniquity that they have set up in their heart. I love you people. I love all God's people. But the stumbling block has to go. Or you're going to end up believing lies. And you won't be sitting here five years from now. I pastored this church for 22 years. 
And I've seen people just like you sit in pews and amen everything I said. And I know some of them right now are living in such a way is that they, they are living like they don't even believe the Bible anymore. I just found out the other day a boy that I grew up with in this church got married in this church is an atheist now. An atheist. Beer guzzling atheist. Does not believe in God. And he sat in this church listening to sermons just like I did and, and, and said amen to things that I preached. He's an atheist now. You know why? You know why? He had a stumbling block of iniquity. And God allowed him to believe a lie. And I don't know if there's hope for him or not. I hope there is. I don't want to see him go to hell. But he will. And I don't want that, I don't want that to happen to you guys. Get rid of it. Let's pray.